Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the resurrection of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be contradicted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. It is significant to note how the newborn Christ child appeared to three groups of people in three ways. Three groups of people in three ways. First, while in the manger, he was present to the shepherds at the indication of an angel. Number two, while in the house, in the arms of his blessed mother Mary, he was present to the wise men under the guidance of a star. And they also had to consult the scriptures. Number three, while in the temple, he was present to Simeon and Anna, guided by the Holy Ghost. Now this shows how God teaches some men by angels, others by miracles that accompany preaching, and still others by an internal illumination of the Holy Ghost. Furthermore, we can note how the shepherds saw the newborn Christ. The wise men adored him, the scriptures say. But the aged Simeon and Anna, they embraced him. They embraced him. So we first recognize Christ, then we adore him, and finally, when we're no longer children in virtue but advanced in the spiritual life, we embrace him. We embrace him with the arms of love, as did Simeon and Anna. Now, notice who were guided by the Holy Ghost most intimately and were able to embrace the Christ child, but Simeon and Anna. Now, they signify the priesthood and the religious life. Priests and religious. What's Simeon doing? He's taking the Christ child and he's offering him to the Father. It's like the mass of the infant Jesus. Anna's in the temple her whole life almost, praying and fasting. Now these vocations are highest because they dispose man more to contemplation. Although others may certainly experience the same things, many married people have entered into the contemplative life, into the mystical life, while still married. It's possible. Although others may certainly experience these same things, the religious life is more disposed to such an intimate relationship because they are disposed, they're supposed to be always in the temple, contemplating divine things, seeking an intimate relationship with God, seeking the coming of the Lord, and woe to them if they do not. The corruption of the highest is always the worst. Well, St. Teresa of Jesus, the great Carmelite mystic, teaches that three things are required for maturity in the spiritual life, which is the same as saying what three things are needed for the happiness of embracing the child Jesus, as Simeon and Anna did. The three things are, St. Teresa, detachment from all things of this world. Detachment. Number two, humility. 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 Number three, love of neighbor. Detachment, humility, love of neighbor. That's what's required to grow in our prayer life, spiritual life, our relationship with God. The more we fulfill these three things, the more we will be like Simeon and Anna, mature, able to see, adore, and embrace the child Jesus, which brings the greatest joy. It's heaven on earth. Now let us turn our focus on detachment today. Let's just pick one. We're going to pick detachment. In view of the poverty of the manger, this is a very good Christmas theme. Christ was detached. Just look at the manger. He's there with beasts in a manger, in a cave. This thing, this year, New Year's coming. If we could just detach even from one thing, that would be a victory. The imitation of Christ says, if I can only overcome one fault a year, how perfect I would be. I'm 45. I'd be over 45 faults by now if I'd only come over one a year. 
That's a pretty powerful statement. If I can only overcome one fault a year, where would I be? Detachment. All right. St. John Hughes comes to our aid in discussion of detachment. He says, In order to deepen detachment from the world in our soul, we must not only strive to separate ourselves from the world, but also to hold it in horror. Yes, to hold it in horror, just as Jesus Christ held it in horror. For Jesus so held the world in horror that not only did he exhort us through his beloved disciple not to love the world nor the things of the world. If any man love the world, the charity of the Father is not in him, says St. John. But also he tells us through his apostle St. James that friendship with the world is to be an enemy of God. Furthermore, he assures us himself, this is from St. John's Gospel, that his kingdom is not of this world, no more than he is of this world, and that those whom his Father has given him are not of this world, just as he is not of it. What is more, what is much more overwhelming is that he solemnly protested at the very time when he manifested the greatest excesses of his goodness, That's at the Last Supper when he is pouring himself out. On the eve of his death, when he was ready to shed his blood and lay down his life for the salvation of men, he solemnly protested what? That he does not pray for the world. That's a powerful statement from the Gospels. He does not pray for the world. In this way, he pronounced a dreadful anathema, a curse, an excommunication against the world, declaring it unworthy to participate in his prayers and his mercy. Thus he assures us that the judgment of the world has already been made and that the prince of the world has already been judged. What's the sentence? You can find it in 2 Peter chapter 3. It's the world will burn by fire. And even though the execution of the sentence has been deferred, Nevertheless, it will be carried out at the end. It follows that Jesus Christ, our Lord, looks upon the world as the object of his hatred and curse, as something that he intends and desires to burn by fire on the day of his wrath. If you're squirming in your pew, I'm squirming right next to you. St. John Eudes is a powerful saint. Embrace, then, he says, these sentiments and inclinations of Jesus toward the world and everything in the world. For now on, look at the world as Jesus looks at it, that is, as the object of his hatred and curse. Look at it as something that he prohibits you from loving under the pain of incurring his enmity. If you love the world, you can't love me. And if you love the world, then you have my enmity. I know, I'm squirming right there with you. As something he has excommunicated and cursed with his own mouth, therefore, you cannot communicate with the world without sharing in his curse. St. John Eudes. It is something he wishes to burn and reduce to ashes. Look upon everything the world values and prefers. Hmm? What are they? Pleasure. Pleasure. Honor. Entertainment. Sports. Wealth. Fame. Worldly friendships and affections. And all other similar things as realities that are only passing away. All is vanity. According to the divine oracle, St. John In his first letter, he says, the world passes away with its lust. They're only nothingness and smoke, deceit and illusion, vanity and affliction of spirit. Consider often then and attentively to this truth. Burn it on your mind. Ask our Lord every day to imprint them in your mind. Now, taking this to heart, we must stop trying to baptize everything that this world has to offer. This is the disease today. It's modernism. Modernism wants to take the supernatural and make it down natural and blend the two as if there's no difference between them. That's the same as trying to baptize everything of the world. Today we try to baptize bad literature, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, all this nonsense. It's destroying us. Movies. 
shows, TV, video games, sporting events, various modern music, if not all of it, and so on. And this is the world, and it will burn. It's all going to go. These are just things the world provides us to waste our time. And they distract us from approaching the child in the manger. Because of them, we fall, we fail to see him. And then we fail to adore him. And we miss the opportunity to embrace him. And when we lose him due to sin, we do not give it much thought. Oh, how worldly we become, how worldly Catholics have become. And while you will be seeking and enjoying the company of the world, St. John Eude says, he who takes his delight in being with the children of men will take no delight in being with you. Yikes. He will not give you any taste of the consolations that he communicates to those who, who, whose only delight is to spend time with him. Thus I say once more to you, flee from this world, flee from it and abhor its life, its spirit and its maxims as fully as possible. Only make friends and spend time in the company of those people who by their example and word can help and inspire you to love our most beloved Jesus, to live in his spirit and to detest everything opposed to him. And this is what Simeon and Anna did. And they were able to embrace the Lord. But let us close with an example today from the lives of the early martyrs. I have a newlywed couple in mind. A newlywed couple. Three weeks they were married. Saints Timothy and Mara, who died on December 19th in preparation for Christmas at the turn of the fourth century in the Middle East. Here's their story. Timothy was married to a Christian lady named Mara, only 17 years of age. She's 17. They'd only been married three weeks when Arianus, the governor of the province, issued an order for the arrest of Timothy, who had been represented to him as one of the greatest enemies of the gods. When the latter was presented, Arianus said to him, Art thou not aware of the edicts of the emperors against those who refuse to sacrifice to the idols? Timothy answered, I am aware of them, but will rather lay down my life than commit such an act of impiety. Now this is the same as saying, I would rather die than sin. Death before sin. Have we resisted to the point of shedding our blood? Then, said the governor, we shall put thee to the torture and hear how thou wilt speak during the infliction. The saint resolutely refused to comply to the governor and the barbarous tyrant caused many horrible tortures to be visited upon him. Seeing, however, that torments had no effect on Timothy, he sent for Mara and told her that he alone or she alone could save her husband from death as by her tears she might induce him to sacrifice to the gods, to give in to the world. Okay, so we don't have idolatry today in that form. We have it in other forms. Worldliness is a form of, of idolatry. So this story applies. She went according to, accordingly to the place and seeing him in so piteous a condition, endeavored to induce him to give in. You don't have to believe in those gods. Just give in. Come on. What about me? We're, all, we're just married. I'm 17. Timothy replied, How is it possible, O Mara, that being thyself a Christian, instead of animating me to die for the faith, thou dost tempt me to abandon it? And thus, to obtain a short and miserable existence here, expose myself to the never-ending pains of hell, is this then thy love? You're my wife. You're supposed to help me. We're to walk each other to heaven. You're to help me get to heaven. I'm to help you get to heaven. But isn't this true? Is this not precisely what Catholics are doing today? Trying to get their fellow Catholics to give in. Stop fighting. Surrender. Conciliate. Surrender to the world. That's what's going on today. And all those guys that are trying hard 
They're attacked, ridiculed. There goes the holy roller trying to go to church every day. How dare you homeschool those children? Conciliate, surrender. That's what's going on. Everybody's trying to make everybody else surrender. I see it all the time. Mara was instantly converted, thanks be to God, by this rebuke of her husband. And casting herself on her knees, besought her blessed Lord with many penitent tears to forgive her. She then asked pardon of her husband and exhorted him to remain firm in his profession of faith, expressing at the same time a desire to sacrifice her own life in atonement for her fault and to be the happy companion of his martyrdom. Timothy, much consoled by the repentance of his wife, told her that her last words had caused him to forget all his past sufferings and that she should forthwith return to the governor to retract her statement and to express her desire of dying for Jesus Christ. Mara at first was afraid to trust her own weakness, but Timothy prayed for her so effectively that the Lord granted her grace and strength to execute the orders of her pious husband. The governor, surprised at her sudden change, endeavored to tempt her, to dissuade her from her holy purpose by promising to obtain for her an advantageous match, a new husband, as soon as her one was dead. But Mara replied that after his death, she would have no other spouse than Jesus Christ. Hereupon, Arianus caused her hair to be violently pulled out and her fingers cut off, after which she too was horribly tortured, but miraculously, she didn't, she didn't remain injured. She remained uninjured. Arianus was much affected by this miracle, causing him to convert some days later. But in the meantime, he sentenced them both to be crucified. While she was proceeding to the place of execution, her dear mother, shedding many tears, embraced her. But the saint, freeing herself from her parents' embrace, hastened to the cross. The husband and wife were crucified on the same cross, one on one side and one on the other. They continued to live in this state for some days, during which time they ceased not to bless the Lord and to encourage each other with the hope that they would soon be united to Jesus Christ in heaven. And now they're saints, husbands, wives, encourage each other to be truly Catholic. The Christ child, Jesus, sends angels and works miracles for those who are detached from this world and all its vanity, vanities. But still he sends the Holy Ghost to illumine them such that they always find him, adore him, and most wonderfully of all, embrace him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.